uh, about a year and a half ago, June 14th was my first day as pastor, and I shortly after that sent a playlist of songs to Randy because I said, I just imagine we're going to need some songs over the coming years in which to lament. A couple weeks, I hadn't even been pastor yet, and Randy and Rhonda walked me through the cemetery here in town and were explaining the connections and relationships and children and parents and siblings to the people here in our church. And I was asked to pray at Memorial Day, and I, was, and I realized that death and uh, grief is not very far away from our community. And so I just sent a playlist, before, you know, first week I was pastor to Randy of, I think it was six songs, and that was one of the songs in the list because I had no idea in the coming three weeks after that that we would need those in those moments. But even this weekend, after uh, Lori's funeral yesterday, I was talking with Emma and the kids about the number of funerals that I've done or attended. Your, some of your children and some of your parents, some of your siblings and some cousins. And so I this morning was putting the file away from Lori's funeral and I realized how that section is growing and the Lord is walking us through that. And so that song this morning reminds me that there are other kinds of grief that we carry, not just funerals and deaths, but the ends of relationships, struggles in marriage, um, work that is so difficult, illnesses that don't go away. And so this morning as I pray, I'm, we, I am using Psalm 60 as a way for us. To, how do we pray when we say goodbye this weekend to our sister and friend Lori? Let's pray together. God, we come on another weekend after saying goodbye to another loved one. And so we, I thank you this morning that you give us the, the invitation and the language to uh, lament before you. To say, God, we are here in the valley of the shadow of death again. Some, it's, uh, it's a grief. Be from, uh, it's a reminder of the death of a loved one. A parent or a sibling or a child in this last year. And a funeral this week reminds us again of the, that hold that we have. All of us will have, uh, we'll miss Lori, the relationship that we had with Lori, some that had also with her husband, Dave. And so, God, we thank you that we get the invitation to come and say, how long, oh Lord? How long will we say goodbye? How long will we... How long will we wake up in the middle of the night in tears? How long will we miss and long to see that loved one again? God, we pray that you and your strength would comfort us in our grief, whatever kind of grief that is, griefs, that are wrong, uh, griefs of wrongs that were done to us, griefs of injustice that nobody seems to care about, griefs of secrets that we've carried for years and years and years. God, I pray that this morning you would be strong for us, that you would wrap those who hurt in your arms. And God, I pray that you would also incline our hearts towards you. It can be so easy in times of grief. It can be so easy in times of darkness for our hearts to turn away, to try and find something to latch onto. And so I pray this morning for those that are here and those in our church that aren't here, God, that you, will, that you, Holy Spirit, would incline our hearts towards you and not away from you. If Satan wants to turn bitterness away and turn, use that to turn us away from you. And God, I pray that you would show yourself mighty to save, inclining our hearts to you. God, I pray this morning for some that are sick. We pray, pray for Dave, who's still battling cancer still concerned about illness, and so he has to stay away. I pray your special blessing on Dave and on Missy and on their family. I thank you for how you've answered prayers. I thank you for good, good reports. I pray, Lord, that you, would, that you would free him and restore him to fellowship again soon. God, we pray for Cheryl, who's still for weeks battling um, to recover so she can move so she can get out, so she can love her grandkids and minister to her family and join us again. I pray your, your special blessing on Cheryl and on Beth and their home this morning. I pray that they would know the nearness of God this Sunday morning. And God, we pray for all of the churches that are around us. We know that we alone are not the kingdom of God, and we alone cannot see the kingdom of God in central Illinois. 
God, I pray that your word would be preached very clearly today. We pray that you would be worshipped and loved and valued the way you ought to be all over this area. God, and I pray for those in our community who think that God has forgotten them, that there's no hope for them, that they've gone too far or too much has happened. God, I pray that even today would be a day that people in our community hear and experience the love of God. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What image comes to mind when you think about walking by faith? What does it look like to walk with Jesus? Maybe the, the way some people tell it, walking with Jesus looks like, do you remember the old cruise ship commercials? Where everything looked amazing and they were singing, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank because of the song. It was in my head a minute ago. It, so the cruise ship commercial where they're singing about how wonderful life is and everything is great. You hear some people tell the story of a life of faith and it's like, if you walk with Jesus, your kids will be better. Your finances will be taken care of. Like things get better and better and better. And that's not to say there's not grace and that there's not wonderful moments. But maybe the idea, what comes to your mind when you think about walking by faith, maybe you go, walking by faith has been a serious struggle. It feels like being in blindness and wondering, where am I going? Maybe the image that comes, maybe you've got a different image that comes to mind of, oh, this is what it means to walk by faith. Today we're starting a new series called Pioneer, Walking with Abraham. Because Abraham is kind of like the start of something new that God is doing in the book of Genesis. We're going to be looking from Genesis chapter 11 to Genesis 25 uh, here this winter and this spring to see what does Abraham have to say to us about what it means to walk by faith? Earlier, Becky read from Hebrews, because Abraham is considered the father of faith, and the New Testament points to him often. So we're going back to Genesis this winter and this spring to say, what does God have to say walking by faith looks like? Not a cruise ship, not walking in blindness, but what does Abraham have to say to us? So go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 11. Today we're going, to be, we're going to be looking at Abraham's life from Genesis 11.27 to chapter 12, verse 9. This is kind of like the beginning of his story. Genesis, I'm actually going to, right now I'm going to read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Let's pray. God, as we open your word, help us to know what it means to walk by faith. And help us to see you at the center of the story. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis, or I'm sorry, when we, when we look at a story in the Bible... We've been spending the fall and into the winter in Philippians, which is a little bit clearer for us because it's a letter from one person to a church. It's a little easier for us to jump into that. But Genesis is a collection of stories. And so as we come to these stories, sometimes we have to see what is the rest of the, how does the rest of the Bible help explain this story to us? It ends up showing us characters with flesh and blood on, sometimes making the right choices and sometimes making the wrong choices. But the entire story gets carried along in scenes with characters and with normal folk. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27, gives us kind of the first scene in Abram's life. You, you may, 
I will probably confuse you by switching back and forth from Abram to Abraham. And if you're wondering, like, what, what's going on with that, there comes a point in this man's life where his name gets changed from Abram to Abraham. His name means father, and it gets changed to exalted father. His wife also gets a slight change in her name from Sarai to Sarah, both meaning princess. But the story starts with verse 27 says, this is the account of Terah's family line. And this is a really important like, line here because the entire book of Genesis is built around that, sen- that kind of, those are the words in that sentence. This is the account of, your translation might say, these are the generations of. Genesis is built around that phrase because it starts back with uh, the creation account and it, so you can see throughout the book, these are the generations of, this is the account of. But it's not just important for Genesis. Because then when we get to Matthew, we see the same words show up in Matthew. It says, this, these are the generations of Jesus the Christ. This, Abraham's story, this isn't just a throwaway line. This is God saying, I am doing something here with the family of Terah. Just before this, what God spread out people all over the face of the earth from the Tower of Babel because they were living in rebellion against God. Before that, God had rescued Noah while destroying the earth and the people on it through an ark. And then, of course, Noah and his sons fall into drunkenness and shame. And so we're kind of at this low point that's like, God, what are you going to do? And then verse 27 says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, And I'll explain why these names mean something here in a second. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram. And together they, sent, they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. This right here sets up, here are the characters in the story. But they're not just characters in this story, because some of them become the extended family that show up again in the stories of Abraham's son and grandson. The, the, the characters on this story, the, the patriarch of the family is Terah. Joshua 24 tells us that Terah and his family, including Abram, were idol worshipers. So God's doing something new, not with a nice church-attending man, not with a pastor. He's starting with a family of idol worshipers who live in what would now be considered like southern Iraq, far from the land of God's promise. They they intend to go on this route to Canaan, but it says they got sidetracked and they stayed in what we would now consider Syria. They now are, are they, they decide to settle down. They're idol worshipers. And this family has got some brothers and some uncles and some, some different people. But notice the description here. Abram married to Sarai, and her identity is barren. This is like this is this the story starts with a couple who worship idols, who have no children. And then God's going to do something in their lives that nobody else would imagine would be. This isn't where you start. If you were going to start a rescue plan, you don't start with an idol-worshipping family far from the place who don't have any children. Then we get to scene 2 in chapter 12, verses 1 to 5, where God says, go to the land, I'm sorry, go from your country to the land that I'm going to show you. And then God starts making promises. He says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. There's a lot of blessings in that. And right here, God is giving Abram one command, go to a place that you don't even know, but I'm going to show it to you. 
And then he says, and I'm going to do something with you and with your life. I am going to bless you. I'm going to oppose the people that oppose you. But more than that, Abram, I am going to turn your life into a blessing to the whole world. God says, my agenda, Abram, does not stop with you and Sarai. And it won't even stop with your family. It's going to include all of the peoples of the earth. So that kind of leads to the crisis. What, what is Abram going to do? Is Abram going to say, what God is this? Is, is he going to say, How, what sign are, is it going to be that you're going to, that you're going to do this? He doesn't say, God, I don't see any method for which, from which you could bless the, me, let alone bless the world. But verse 5 says, here's, what's, well, here's what Abram does. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. It's a, Abram's part in this story is really small, and God's part in this is really big. God is the one who comes to Abram, gives him something, and Abram goes, okay, I'm going to leave my family. This is a rejection that I think we could probably understand it a little bit, because here in central Illinois, family matters a lot. Family matters a lot. Who your parents are, who your siblings are, the connections that you have matter a lot. And Abram is called to leave them behind can't make phone calls home, is likely to never see them again, doesn't even know where he's going. And verse 5 says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Which leads then to the third scene in this story, verse, starting in verse 5. So he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions he had accumulated, and the people he had acquired in Haran, that would be servants in his household. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. The Negev is the the southern part of what's now the land of Israel. And so Abram does what God calls him to, and then he begins the journey of his life, walking and worshiping. This, This is a pretty simple description. He doesn't do a whole lot, except he goes into a land that somebody else owns, the God of the universe has promised to give it to him and so he just walks and wanders and worships here in this story abram doesn't do a whole lot but yet he gets a whole lot he gets the promises of god to i'm going to give this to your offspring we'll find out later abram's reaction to some of these promises right here abram doesn't even have offspring and god has said i'm going to give this to your offspring. You see, this story, starting at this low point in the book of Genesis, the Tower of Babel, the destruction during Noah's day, the shame of Noah's family, this story starts and tells us God is beginning His rescue plan. God is beginning His rescue plan, and Abram responds to it. This is a call to you and I to respond to God's first move. Walking by faith looks like us responding to God's first move, not trying to force God's hand. What I want to show you today is I want to show you four ways to respond in the life of faith that we see in Abram's life. Four ways to respond in the life of faith that we see here in Abram's life. First, the description of Abram's family teaches us to respond in hopeless situations. The account of Abram's family calls to us that hopeless situations are not barriers to God doing something. God does not start with a pastor and his family or a deacon and his family. He doesn't start with Jacob with 12 sons. He starts with a 75-year-old man with a barren wife who worships idols. And he, he starts after the Tower of Babel. Not after they've gotten their worship right. This is a hopeless situation here. And it, this is a calling to you and I and saying that hopeless cases 
are God's specialty. Hopeless cases are God's specialty. And so when we're called to walk with God, when we're called to respond to God, we might go, if I can just, if you're like me, you go, if I can just get this straight. If you realize that some area of your life and you're like, this is, this is bad. I'm ashamed of this. I wish I didn't respond like this. I wish I wasn't caught in this kind of sin. We want to cover it up and fix it so we can go to church and we can like look right on the outside. And this says, hopeless cases are God's specialty. This is one of the great themes of the Bible. It is, I don't, it's not an accident. It's not just incidental that Sarah was, Sarah was barren and Rebecca was barren and Rachel was barren and Hannah was barren and Mary shouldn't have a child because the, the reason that that is so important in the history of the Bible is because God is saying, I am going to do something that you can't do on your own. But it's not just, a, so it's just not barrenness in women's life. It's men who come who are sick and demon-possessed, and Jesus is like, here's my best work. This is where I start. Not with Pharisees who attend and tithe and do all of their different things. It's the people that, go, that stand in the corner and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, because I don't even belong here. In the story of the Bible, hopeless cases are God's best. He loves them. And so if you wake up in the middle of the night and you say, God, how can you do something with this? Abram and Sarah say, yes, we have been there too. We have been there too. This this story that starts with their hopeless situation is a call to you and I to orient our hearts towards God from our hopeless situations. Those situations where we say, God, can you ever restore this relationship? God, can you ever deliver us out of this? God, can you ever provide for this? God, can you ever fix this broken heart? This is a call to our church to say that hopeless people and hopeless cases and hopeless situations are God's specialty. And so that should be our specialty. So the first way to respond from this story is to respond in hopeless situations. Second way to respond from this story is to respond to God's agenda. I want you to notice the promise to Abraham in verses 1 to 3. Respond to God's agenda. Here, where God is doing something new, he says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Here in God's promises to Abram, God's agenda becomes clear. That God is up to something not just for Abram's sake, but it's for every person on earth. God's agenda is not just to have some worshipers in the land of Israel. God's, worship, God's agenda is not just a few people would know his glory and to love him. It's that people all over the world would be blessed. And God's going to be the one to move first. And one of the things that this calls to you and I to do is that our agenda cannot be smaller than God's agenda. Our agenda can't be smaller than God's agenda. If his goal in Abram's life and in Israel's life and in Jesus and in the New Testament is that all peoples of the earth would be blessed, then our agenda for our church, for our families, and for our lives can't be smaller than that. Our agenda has got to be that all of the peoples on earth would be blessed. That every person in Manchester would be blessed. That everybody in Scott County and in the communities around us, that everybody in our, in our workplaces and in our schools would get to know the blessing of God who moves first. I'm reminded of Carl Henry's quote where he once said, the gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. And so, like, if this is God's agenda, then when we look at our friends and neighbors, when we look at people in town that we may not ever mix with, when we look at the people in our school, when we look at the people in our workplaces, 
the good news of God's agenda is that it includes them. And that God moves first, not waiting for them to clean up their act, not waiting for us to clean up our act. And so our goal for our families, for our our kids and our grandkids, has got to be big enough that we say, God, I know that you are wanting to bless the whole world. And I want that to be true in our family. I want our family's agenda to be that big. God, I want our church's agenda to be worldwide, to be community-wide, to include people like Abram who worship other gods and don't know that there's a God of the universe who loves them and has hope for them. And so this, is, this call is, is a, will we respond to this gospel? Will, we res, will our church respond to God's agenda? Second way to respond, or I'm sorry, the third way to respond in the life of faith is to respond to God's word. Look at verse 4. Verse 4, where Abram hears God's call, knows what he's supposed to do, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. This is like this is bare bones basic Christianity. This is bare bones basic life of faith. It's not responding to an impression, not responding to what makes sense. It is as the Lord told him. That is what the life of faith always is. The Christian life is always responding to God because in the Bible, responding to God's word is responding to him. So that when we hear God's word in on Sunday, during the week, in our devotions, in Sunday school, in their, our men's breakfast group, in, in one of the places, in our families as we read Scripture, when we hear God's Word, our response to His Word is our response to God. And so when God calls out our sin, of sinful anger, of not controlling our tongue, of not gossiping, of not loving our neighbor as we, should, as we ought to, as not loving our enemies then that's our response to God. This passage calls us and says that the Christian life is always a response to God's word and the only safe place is in responding to him. We know what that's like in our relationships. If you're married, you know what it's like. You don't get a pass. I love you, I just don't ever remember what you tell me. I love you, I just don't listen to you. We don't give each other that room in a relationship where we go, oh, I love you, I just, it doesn't matter what you say to me. And in the same way, in the, in the Christian life, the life of faith, our response to God is our response to His Word. And so, will we be a people? Will we be individuals who respond to God's Word? In, even if my spouse does not go with me, I'm going to love Jesus and obey His Word. Even if my kids don't love and obey God, I'm going to love and obey God. Even if it is hard to love and obey God at work, I, even if nobody goes with me, I'm going to. Will we be a people, will we be a church that says we are going to go as the Lord told us? And the fourth way to respond from the, in the life of faith from this passage is respond with walking and worship. Respond with walking and worship. Look at verses 6 through 9. I read this a few minutes ago, but it says that Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The story of Abram's life after this point is that he wanders and he continues to worship. Wherever he went, he's setting up altars, which is, it's a, it's a place for him to worship, and it's kind of like claiming this land for the Lord, not claiming it for himself. But the story of Abram's life is that he continued to walk, and in those places he continued to worship. This is a new thing in Abram's life. He was not normally a, a worshiper of, of, the, of Yahweh. He was not a worshiper of the God of Israel. He had been an idol worshiper, as Joshua 24 told us. And so his entire life, begins to be walking and worshiping. Abram teaches us that the life of faith is a life of worship. It's not simply a life of obedience. It's not simply a life of doing stuff. It is somebody walking and worshiping and saying, God, I love you more right here. God, I love you right here more than ever. 
Continuing to do that. That's why in Matthew 22, Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Because the goal of the Bible is not behavior. It is worship. The story of the Bible doesn't lead just to good works. It it leads to enjoying God forever in Revelation 22. The story of the Bible is calling us, will we worship while we wander and while we walk? Will we worship in the middle of the night when we wake up again and we wonder what's going on? Will we worship when we're in a land that's owned by somebody else? Will we worship while our barns are empty or when our barns are full? Will we worship when our spouse is so hard to live with and they hate our walking with Jesus? Can we worship there too? Will we worship beside graves in hospital rooms? Will we worship when there's new babies that cry in the middle of the night? Will we worship when we're alone? Will we worship and will we worship while we walk? That is the, Abram's invitation to us is to say, come in the life of faith with me. You see, Abram never got the land of promise. God promised here in verse 7, I'm going to give this to your offspring. And so the rest of his life, in the ups and in the downs, in the mistakes and in the sins, Abraham is wandering, believing, and worshiping. That is the point. When God rebukes the people of Israel, He says, your heart is far from me. You're, you're coming and offering sacrifices, but your heart is not here. And so God calls us in this and says, I'm going to move first. Will you worship while you walk with me? Will you worship while you walk with me? Believer, I want you to see the pattern that is here. This is how God works in the Christian life. He moves first and he calls us to respond. God moves first. He calls us to respond. He delivers in the Exodus and he calls them to worship. He delivers us in Christ and he invites us to worship. He moves first in our lives in giving us, if you're in Christ, in giving you the record of the Son of God. He moves first in giving you the identity of a beloved Son. He moves first in giving you the Holy Spirit to empower you to worship. And now He says, now walk with me and worship. If you are are a believer, your record in all of this is the record of Jesus. The record of walking the record of worshiping, and the Holy Spirit's power to do that. But if you're an unbeliever, if you're here and you say, I, have, I don't know what you're talking about. What does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to believe in Jesus? How can I know that I have this? The story of the Bible is the story that God made the world and that he made it good. He put Adam and Eve in a garden that he had already provided everything for them and said, here is one rule. And that one rule expressed that God is the one in authority and Adam and Eve and you and I would live under his authority. But Adam and Eve and you and I, every person has said, no, we will not live your way, God. We do not want you as king over us. And so, the Bible calls that sin and says that the wages of sin is death. That is physical death in this life and eternal death in hell forever. But instead of leaving us there, the Bible says that Jesus came and lived the life that we should live. Like Abram, wandering with no place to call his own. Jesus wandered his entire life, responding in faith and obedience to God's word. Loving his father, even from the cross, when he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Jesus lived the life that we should live and died the death that we should die so that everybody who repents of their sin, that means to turn away from it, trust in Jesus to save them and begins to follow him, can know that they are saved. That is the response that God wants. That is the response God, that we start with, turning from sin, trusting in Jesus to save us, and then following him. If that's you today, come and grab me at the end of the service. We sing a song and you can come and grab me. You can grab me when I'm in the back. You can grab the person that brought you here. And say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be saved. This passage calls us to respond to God's first move. Respond in hopeless situations. Respond to God's agenda. Respond to God's word and respond with walking and worship. 
I want you to imagine what happens in your own hopeless situation when you realize that God is here first. I want you to imagine what changes in whatever that hopeless situation for you is. The relationship that you don't think could ever be fixed. Imagine what changes if you realize God is here and moving first. I want you to imagine with me what, happen, what changes in our church when our, God's agenda is our agenda and we realize He's moving first. I want you to imagine what changes in our lives which we begin to walk and worship. No matter what this week or this year holds, in the jobs and in the families and in the homes and in the communities, it would, no matter what our future holds, imagine what changes when that looks like worship there too. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word here. God, we, I thank you that this is the story of you starting a rescue and inviting me into it. I thank you that your rescue didn't depend on us moving first. I pray, Lord, that we would be a community, we would be individuals, we would be a church that is following your first move. In Jesus' name, amen.